So, Dr. Thomas, we are uh, glad to have you here in Romania, in Bucharest, at the Theological Pentecostal uh, Seminary, teaching uh, a course on uh, Revelation. Mm -hmm. It's a good uh, opportunity to uh, have you here. And uh, with that occasion, uh, I'd like to ask you a few questions. And um, if the facts of your uh, career, academic career, can be easily found out through Google Books or uh, even uh, via Wikipedia, you already have a page uh, on that. <laughs> I don't know if you ever <laughs> knew that. Uh, it's not very... Um, uh, the information about your uh, background uh, is not uh, uh, known, at least uh, not for me. So. I'd like to ask you to give us some uh, information on, on your uh, background and uh, how you remember Pentecostalism in your uh, childhood. I often discover that uh, uh, these experiences are very significant for, uh, for scholars and uh, I'd like to, you to speak uh, extensively on that for the beginning. Well, my, uh, my Childhood is one uh, that is rich with the Pentecostal experience. My first memories are of being in church. Um, and the, the churches that I was part of were very um, demonstrative. Uh, lots of uh, shouting, lots of uh, speaking in tongues and prophetic utterances and praying for the sick. And uh, I discovered as I moved through the years that a lot of my formation, a lot of what I believe about healing, for example, or spirit baptism uh, was acquired, I was formed, uh, my views were in, in altar services. That's where I learned a lot about what I believe. So it was a very integrated experience uh, to experience firsthand the, the core sort of theological tenets um, around which our tradition revolves of uh, the fivefold gospel, you know, Jesus as Savior and Sanctifier and Spirit Baptizer and Healer and Coming King. And uh, I would have to say that probably 80 to 90 percent of the sermons that I heard growing up were related to one or more of those elements. And later in life when I read Don Dayton's Theological Roots of Pentecostalism or, and then Steve Land's uh, Spirituality book, I thought that's exactly right, that, that fits my experience perfectly. And so um, I was uh, privileged to have as pastors people that had been significant leaders in the Church of God. Uh, former General Overseer uh, Leonard Carroll was a pastor of ours before he became one of the leaders in the church. And uh, pioneer preacher Paul H. Walker was uh, one of our pastors. And then my dad accepted the call to ministry and uh, took a church that had nine children and two adults and uh, built the church over a six year period until there were about 120 there. And uh, I learned a lot watching him. He was a bivocational bi pastor in those days. And we had uh, very intense worship services. Uh, I learned a lot about the moving of the spirit as well as uh, learned a lot about people who, as we say, would get in the flesh and uh, discovered that in Pentecostal worship it wasn't a dualistic understanding that it was either God or the devil, but there was that middle ground of, of the flesh. Uh, and of course, uh, being folk who paid attention to sanctification, uh, uh, understood uh, the flesh as a ground where we worked out our salvation in many ways. And so uh, I would say that my early years in particular really revolved around the church. And uh, that was where I was formed. And that um, is still a huge part of, uh, of my story. Mm -hmm. Are there any significant experiences that you relate to when you uh, look in the past? I mean, uh, in the way of uh, healings or uh, 
other uh, land landmarks that you you relate to or you refer to when evaluating your uh, uh, spiritual uh, trajectory? Well, I remember when I uh, I remember when I was saved. Uh, I was just a little boy. I was five years old, and we'd gone to a, a youth service uh, on Saturday nights. We had a, a thing called Young People's Endeavor. And uh, I remember my mom was uh, not in church that night. She was ill, I believe. And we were uh, at church, and they showed a film about Christ. And I remember when, during the crucifixion scenes, feeling terrible about it and feeling some kind of heaviness in my heart and wondering what all that, that meant, kind of feeling vicariously responsible even at that young age. And, and I remember when I came home and I was telling my mom about it and she, she was discerning enough to know that I was feeling even at that point uh, the convicting power of the Spirit. And so I remember that very clearly. I remember seeking the baptism of the Spirit and uh, was filled with the Holy Ghost when I was seven. Um, and my dad, my step stepfather technically, uh, was seeking for the Spirit at the same time and and, and didn't receive the Spirit at that point, it was a bit later. Uh, but yeah, I, I, you know, all of those experiences were important personally. In the church my father started, we saw several healings, uh, dramatic healings, uh, braces coming off, uh, one woman who uh, could not hear very well at all uh, had been prayed for and, and that night one of her family members was making popcorn and she said, what is that noise? She would never heard it popping before. And so we, we saw a number of those. We saw people have uh, breakthroughs and be delivered from tobacco and, and alcohol and other uh, uh, substances. Uh, people's lives who just turned completely around, you know, epistles, uh, living epistles, if you will. And so, you know, all of those things were, were very powerful, um, spirit baptisms, uh, living in the light of the end, yeah, all of that. How, how did you experience uh, spirit baptism? How, how uh, did it manifest? I, I assume, obviously, that you, you mean the physical uh, initial evidence, uh, the tongues, uh, were there any other manifestations that accompanied that? Well, there was a great deal of joy. Uh, there was a sense of being in communion with God in a way that I had not before. I mean, even, even at that young age, I could, uh, um, I could discern that there was a difference in uh, how close to God I had, had become and just a, really a saturation in the spirit. Uh, you know, uh, I remember as we were leaving uh, the church uh, that night that that uh, it was hard to um, it was hard to even think about um, uh, things as normal then. And I remember uh, saying to myself, I'm, "I'm not going to say anything to anybody about it." What, what uh, were you looking for that experience, or you, it happened? Yes, and yes. You, you were I've been pursuing it. You, you had been pursuing yeah. it, and, and and for for a little while, I don't know how long, but uh, several of the sisters gathered around me that night as I prayed. And um, as we say, prayed through. Mm -hmm. uh, since you mentioned your father and the fact that he was pursuing the spirit baptism experience, uh, I became uh, curious to know, and I think that a lot of Romanians, Pentecostals, would be curious to know how this uh, pursuit uh, is uh, organized or is manifested. I mean, uh, are there um, special prayers, uh, laying on of hands, or? Uh, what is, would the typical environment be or uh, in that uh, area? Well, we, we were quite sensitive to uh, being desirous of the experience. We, we talked about it as being hungry uh, for the spirit, uh, similar to a physical appetite. And um, as one was more and more sensitive to that, um, they spent more and more time in the altar. And, and as uh, altar invitations would be given uh, for those who were seeking the experience, uh, they would be in the altars a lot. 
Would, yeah, would there be special times for prayer and for the seekers of this experience or with the whole church? Uh, often it would be part of the, the altar call at the end. Uh, they would have special times of intercession. Um, at, at the camp meetings and such, of course, there's you know just massive numbers of people in the altar all kind of there for different reasons. But um, yeah, it was very purposeful. Uh, seeking the baptism of the Spirit. You knew that if you um, were in Pentecost, uh, you saw the light on uh, that experience, and that's what you wanted because you wanted all that God had for you. Mm -hmm. And for us, that was certainly part of what He had for us. Do you happen to have a non direct knowledge of any cases of uh, Xenolalia or speaking in? Uh known tongues by people who actually do not know them, but these tongues are, uh, can I, be recognized by other uh, native speakers. I heard, I heard testimonies. Um, our church was not one to claim, you know, in some of the early Pentecostal literature, they, they would often claim the gift of um, the language of Chinese or, or what have you, and, and, and we the Church of God was not really part of that, uh, that tradition. It, it may have been uh, that by the time the Church of God was experiencing Pentecost, <clears throat> that some of uh, the ideas about Xenolalia were already tested and, and kind of passing away. Though, um, in my life, I've heard a number of testimonies to that effect. I've, I've sometimes heard what I thought was a word of another language that I didn't know. Uh, I, I thought at one point I detected my dad um, praying certain Hebrew um, phrases, and he had never studied Hebrew. Uh, but I, I've not personally been in a situation where there was someone who spoke fluently and there was someone present who who picked up on that. Mm -hmm. So uh, you took your uh, degree from Lee College in uh, 1976, if I'm correct, and then a uh, Master of Arts from uh, um, the Church of God School of Theology uh, and uh, studied also at uh, Ashland Theological Seminary, which uh, is connected with the Brethren uh, yeah. uh, denomination. Why Ashland? I mean, of all uh, Places, given the fact that they were uh, secessionist, or well, uh, <clears throat> they were not um, part of the brethren stream that were antagonistic uh, to Pentecost. Really, the Lord um, rather supernaturally directed me there, and um, uh, it was almost an Abrahamic kind of journey. I remember. Uh, the, the, dean, the dean from the seminary had uh, had come to, to our seminary to, to recruit students who would transfer there because we, at that point, weren't accredited. And um, I remember um, uh, some things were happening in our family, and I remember getting up one morning uh, and just saying, asking the Lord for direction. Uh, it came by way of a, a person at a restaurant that I felt the Lord directing me to to speak with. And uh, later that day, I wound up at Ashland Seminary. And it was, it was a remarkable uh, event. But they were very hospitable. They uh, seemed very happy to have me there. They were evangelical in a, in a good sense, um, um, kind of ecumenical in a conservative way. They weren't rationalists. They um, they had a respect for uh, experience. I remember a uh, particular, in particular, uh, a professor named Jerry Flora, a really great uh, man who who um, helped me uh, process some of all of that. It, we, we, at the time, I didn't realize quite how significant it was, but but later did. And then you moved to Princeton, uh, where you worked with uh, 
Bruce Metzger, the Dean of uh, Textual Criticism mm -hmm. uh, at that time. Um, in his autobiography, uh, I was surprised to discover that he says very little about his uh, personal faith or he's not as reflective as uh, one might expect him or should expect him to be. How did you perceive him uh, in uh, working with uh, him for one year or uh, you had a lot of interaction uh, with him? Well, one of the results of going to Ashland was uh, the New Testament professor there, Louis Goff, had actually done a doctoral degree with Metzger in text criticism. And one day Dr. Goff pulled me aside and, and said, you know, I know you want to go on to school and uh, have you thought about doing a THM? And I said, well, uh, I thought about it, but I haven't had any concrete, concrete thoughts about it. And he said, well, you might ought to think about going to Princeton and, and working with Bruce Metzger. And of course that was, um, you know, seemed to me to be uh, uh, kind of an impossible sort of reach uh, for a boy from Appalachia. Uh, and uh, uh, golf set up the meeting. Uh, as I look back on it, I mean, he was very instrumental in all that. And I met with Metzger in his home on a good Friday and uh, he very graciously uh, said, well, uh, why don't you uh, take a course with me this summer on the Sermon on the Mount and see what you make of it. And so, um, of course, when I got to Princeton and, and took the course, I was hooked and finished the time out at Ashland and came back to Princeton. Uh, Metzger was my uh, supervisor or my advisor there. I did a number of courses with him. Um, he was a very, very, very gracious individual. Uh, someone who had a real sense of personal piety. Uh, he uh, attended uh, chapels very regularly. Uh, it was clear that he saw his, his life as, uh, and work as a service to the Lord. And I think took special pride in the fact, in a spiritual kind of way, that uh, all the years he worked on the Revised Standard Version and the New Revised Standard Version, he never took any remuneration for. And so, um, yeah, I was, as I read the, the, the biography, the autobiography, I was, um, I was wanting a bit more in terms of his own reflection, but, but it was, it was a bit more of, um, um, the facts and then this happened and that happened. Um, in Romania we talk about Pentecostals as being uh, <coughs> evangelicals, which uh, I expect uh, is not the case in the US or evangelicals have uh, an identity which is uh, pretty clear and the Pentecostals uh, uh, identify themselves as uh, uh, somewhat uh, different in some, some uh, respects. Um, how do you, um, uh, what, what would you, uh, what do you consider are the main traits of uh, Pentecostals or uh, what define them as a separate group from uh, Evangelicals? Uh, and, uh, well, I think there's a lot of, uh, <clears throat> I think there's a lot of debate about that. I think there, since the, since Pentecostals, uh, were approached by the National Association of Evangelicals in the U.S. in the in the 40s to be part of that group. They had earlier been spurned by the fundamentalists. And um, I think that that, one of my colleagues, Hollis Gall, said that it was a real step toward uh, uh, moving away from a negative sectarian understanding to a more positive one. But I think one of the byproducts of that was that some of the hallmarks and uh, characteristics of Pentecostalism were de-emphasized. I think evangelicals, uh, I think Pentecostals can sign statements of faith that some evangelicals would like, like us to sign. And Pentecostal numbers account for a great number of the evangelicals in North America. But the, uh, the, the spirituality uh, and the worldview are, are quite different. And I mentioned earlier the fivefold gospel. Uh, in some cases, with some groups, uh, the only thing we agree on is, 
is a, an understanding of Jesus as Savior. Uh, we're closer to our holiness uh, uh, brothers and sisters. They, they may be fr fraternal twins with us. Um, in some ways, oddly enough, we're closer to the Roman Catholic tradition uh, and at least theologically closer to the Orthodox tradition. Uh, when you take those five uh, cardinal sort of uh, understandings uh, of the, the theological heart of the tradition. And so I think the, the, the problem with uh, North American evangelical identities for Pentecostalism is uh, often uh, the rest of the full gospel uh, we are asked to de-emphasize in order to have that kind of minimal uh, agreement and as I told one person once who was asking about that I said well Pentecostals don't really do minimalism uh, and so we're we're often asked not to be who we are um, in order to be part of the larger group uh, part of the problem in the US is having gone through the modernist fundamentalist controversy the the lines really hardened in ways that they didn't in in the UK for example or the the different kind of definition uh, for evangelical that often exists in Europe. Uh, and, but it's quite different in the States. Uh, there's a, uh, uh, yeah. Do you have any recollections about the debates and turmoil within, for example, the Presbyterian Church when the charismatic uh, wave uh, hit them? And uh, even Bruce Metzger, I think, was asked uh, at some point uh, back in 1970, to serve on a committee to evaluate the phenomenon of glossolalia and uh, give uh, his opinion as a biblical scholar. Uh, do you remember any of the debate? Because even uh, some of the Pentecostal scholars were interviewed by, uh, by the committee formed with that occasion. Well, I remember um, <clears throat> hearing about things. I, I remember that the question for a lot of classical Pentecostals uh, was, can people be baptized in the Spirit without having experienced sanctification? And, and of course, uh, for a number of the people in uh, mainline churches who were, who were experiencing the charismatic renewal, their statements of faith and understandings of the gospel were not identical to ours. And so that was, that was uh, difficult to uh, reconcile and of course you had a lot of people who were very hard line about it and rejecting that since they weren't doing what we had done. Uh, I remember in camp meetings uh, one of the first people, I think his name was Bobby Ross, uh, who had preached a camp meeting and basically challenged us as a denomination. Uh, he had, uh, it appears, had received a number of people into his church. He was a pastor in Charlotte and was challenging us to rethink uh, what God was doing there. The denomination, of course, had, had generated a book called uh, The Glossolalia Phenomenon as an attempt to offer some direction to um, our younger charismatic brothers and sisters, uh, which was perceived by some to be a bit... Um, uh, yeah, yeah uh, pretentious uh, uh, that we would try to tell them, but I, I think part of it was well-intentioned at least, uh, trying to find, find one's place. Of course, uh, the other thing to remember in those days is Pentecostals were really on the margins. Uh, socially, I remember growing up, um, we were on from the other side of the tracks, as, as uh, we would put in the States. And I remember the anomaly of having uh, Leonard Carroll as our pastor, who had an earned doctoral degree from the University of Tennessee. And one day my uh, elementary school teacher telling me, you know, your pastor is uh, the most educated man in the town. And so that was quite, quite odd, uh, given the social perceptions. Uh, it, was, it was clear uh, how the, the food chain worked religiously in, in our little community uh, with the uh, First Baptist Church or certain uh, Methodist congregations being at the very top. 
Uh, we didn't have any Catholics to speak of. I think there were only a couple of Jewish families in the town. Uh, Pentecostals were, were on the bottom of the barrel. So you grew up with pretty tough skin. And so when the, when the charismatic renewal began, there were no doubt some issues of social class involved in trying to sort through trying to sort through that. And I do think that some of the folks at the Charismatic Renewal wanted to stay in their churches, and others couldn't quite abide being associated with Pentecostals. Uh, and, and so, you know, as I recall, those were some of the dynamics, but those are just reflections of a, you know, a young uh, teenage boy. Uh, coming back to your um, uh, scholarship, um, or um your contribution in, in scholarship. I'd like to ask you, what do you think is the most, uh, most significant uh, uh, contribution in this area so far, uh, when you look back to what you have written and uh, researched, uh, what would you say is the most important for you or uh, most significant? Well, that's a very difficult question. Um, I've had a sense in, in my major research projects of being called to those projects. Uh, I had that sense about the foot washing uh, research. Um, I had that sense about the monograph on the devil disease and deliverance that looked at the uh, origins of illness owing to all the dualistic kind of claims that were being made in the tradition. I, uh, I had that sense as I was writing the commentary on the epistles and I have that sense about my work on the apocalypse. So I, I don't know, I don't know um, how to answer the question. I, I think that the foot washing piece has, has had a significance um, in some ways that's hard to measure. Among scholars, the things that have been done on foot washing more recently have taken seriously the practice in the community which was not the case when I started. Uh, and, and several scholars have used uh, sacramental language to describe the phenomenon. So I, I, I've, been, I've been pleased to see that, that it may have had some impact. Uh, on the other hand, the devil disease and deliverance, uh, I, think it's, I think it's had an impact in its own way. I've, I've certainly been asked to go a lot of places almost globally, in the various places around the world, uh, to engage um, in conversations about it and related issues. Uh, the commentary, I think, uh, charts a new court, uh, a new path uh, by its dialogical nature and the way in which uh, those commentaries are written. And, and I have a real sense that I was just, <clears throat> I was really led to um, the uh, Apocalypse Project. Uh, I remember I was in London once and uh, was editing the last bits of Max Turner's massive book, uh, Power From On High. And we went for a walk and I, uh, uh, Max told me about a commentary series he was editing and, and that he wondered if I would be open to writing something for it. And I said, well, I said, I've never told anybody this before but I'm starting to feel like my, my next project will be on the apocalypse. Uh, I had been led to that <clears throat> by means of a, a remark my colleague, Rick Moore at the time, had said to me in passing one day, Rick's very prophetic, and he said, I can't wait till you get to the apocalypse. And I said, I'm not getting to the apocalypse. Uh, and then I heard this wonderful testimony by a brother Marushkin from Russia in chapel one day about uh, the history. He told this. He told the story of the history of Russia by means of the apocalypse, uh, and said in 1917 the beast arose, and he just spun it all out. <clears throat> and while I wondered, uh, did John have any idea that uh, uh, there would be somebody named Stalin uh, arise? Um, Brother Marushkin's exposition of the Apocalypse was more authentic and self-authenticating than anything I'd ever been exposed to. 
And I read, then I read Richard Balcom's Theology of the Book of Revelation. I read it with my guard down uh, just to experience the book. And so Max says, well, that's all well and good, but we need you to write on uh, the epistles of John. And so I uh, talked to the community about it, prayed about it, and reluctantly agreed since I'd already was working on another commentary on John, the epistles. Uh, and about a year later, I got a, a, a note from uh, Joel Green saying, our contributor on the apocalypse has had to drop out. Would you consider doing that? For what series? Uh, the the Erdman's Two Horizons uh, series. And so, um, I, I really don't know. I think, I think the, the editing and the uh, creation of, of uh, publishing venues for Pentecostals may have been one of the more significant things that we were allowed to be involved in by the Lord. Uh, because uh, about the time we started, there were precious few options for academics uh, within the tradition to publish. Now speaking uh, about uh, Revelation uh, and the commentary you are currently writing, uh, it would be interesting to know what were the most surprising uh, things you discovered while uh, taking a fresh look at uh, and a very close uh, look for that matter uh, at, uh, at this book. Um, was there anything that uh, took you aback even though of course oh, you yeah, knew yeah. the book? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was like it was like discovering a, a new book in the canon, uh, because um, Revelation is so uh, challenging. I had not really uh, spent much time with the book, and I just discovered, uh, I suppose, first of all, the intricate and lovely literary um, structure, which looks like it must have taken years and years and years to work out, but which John claims came to him in a vision. And uh, I'm pretty convinced that that's how it happened and that it was an intertextual moment mm -hmm. in which everything converged in John as he saw this vision. Uh, I was quite struck by the robust pneumatology. I had no idea about the pneumatology. I was like the disciples of John, who didn't even know there'd be a Holy Ghost uh, when it came to the apocalypse. Uh, it, it, basically, the, the pneumatology had been stolen from us by our dispensational brothers and sisters. Is there uh, anything in the Left Behind series that is uh, close to uh, what Revelation uh, is meant to teach us? Uh, <laughs> are, are the authors uh, anyway near to what uh, to where they should be in reading uh, Revelation? Well, I, I've learned in reading Revelation to have, a, to try to have a sense of humility about, uh, about evaluating others' positions. But when I was trying to do a section on the effective history of the apocalypse in film, I looked at a, a number of the Left Behind films, and there just wasn't hardly anything about the Book of Revelation. Uh, they had the they had the, the script, uh, the dispensational script, but the script allows one to just kind of pick and choose, and you get a whole different uh, vantage point, uh, or or a, a whole different view of the apocalypse when you come to it on in its on its own terms, and so. Um, uh, I find that one of the challenges for students who have cut their teeth on, on left behind type things is to be able to actually focus on the text and be able to ask questions of the text uh, that are almost self-generated. Um, there's this, there's this extraordinary emphasis on the um, um, pneumatic witness which a faithful witness that, that follows the Lamb wherever he goes. Um, there is this intense, this keen sense of the sovereignty of God uh, throughout the book. And I suppose the other thing was just the optimism 
of the conversion of the nations rather than a survivalist kind of understanding of how bad the end is going to be. The book of Revelation has an optimism that um, knows no bounds. And so, yeah, just, uh, you know, it's, it's been a learning, it's, it's been the most exhilarating uh, experience in my academic life and the most exhausting uh, all at one time. In closing this section about Left Behind series, since you are in Romania, now I hope you noticed that the name of the Antichrist is the Nicolae Carpadia. Carpadia is being the chain of mountains that uh, across uh, Romania and uh, that he is from, uh, from Romania. And uh, Nicolae obviously uh, has a, uh, in some intertextuality with our own uh, dictator. <laughs> right. I'm not sure right. whether you were aware of Well, that. I remembered the name, but I did not make all those connections. And uh, so, uh, that's quite interesting indeed, isn't it? <laughs> so he does come from Romania. So maybe it's no coincidence <laughs> that you, as a scholar on Revelation, uh, are uh, back, uh, are in Romania. The, country of the dictator of the Antichrist, uh, well, according to the left behind series. There we are, there we are indeed. Um, a few more words on uh, the book uh, about food washing. Uh, we have it uh, in uh, Romanian translation and we uh, had it uh, launched uh, here at the college. Uh, could you uh, give us a summary of the, uh, or the abstracts uh, of the book? How would you uh, summarize uh, its argument? Well, uh, yes, the, it, it, it's been very exciting to me to, to see the book in Romanian and uh, appreciate very much the uh, efforts of the translator and editor with whom I speak uh, and all of those who made it possible. I've known a number of Romanian students over the years and, and we've talked extensively about foot washing. Uh, I suppose the thesis of the book is that foot washing was a practice um, in the Johannine community um, that was a sign of the continual cleansing from sin that's available to believers, a sign in the sense of uh, extension, one might say, of baptism, and that uh, this is to be practiced uh, in the church today. Uh, based on a literary analysis primarily, I came to those conclusions and then tested the conclusions of implied readers uh, by finding actual readers of John 13 to see if they, they interpreted it as uh, entailing literal fulfillment. And um, what I found was the vast preponderance of those who knew the, the Johannine account do indeed call for a liter literal practice and that a number of uh, early um, commentators on foot washing were sensitive to the cleansing theme that is there. And so, in short, that's, that's the thesis. Is foot washing, uh, how, how is foot washing practiced in, uh, in the U.S.? In what kind of context and uh, how do people uh, approach it? Uh, I imagine there is a spectrum of um, interpretations or uh, even practices or contexts in, in which it is done. Yes, you're, you're right. The, um, it varies a lot. Uh, it has been uh, declining. Uh, it's not uncommon for me to hear from people who have read something I wrote to say You've, you have redeemed this practice for me. Uh, I didn't understand it. I think the, the norm, one of the normal ways to, to understand foot washing has been that it's a sign of humility. Others uh, have argued in the Church of God that it's a sign of service. But as early as about 1953 or 54, there was a book written that looked at the Lord's Supper and, and uh, foot washing and tied foot washing to sanctification. And some of my students have done uh, analyses of uh, foot washing in early Pentecostalism in the Church of God. And their, their assessments in some ways were more informed than later assessments were. Uh, foot washing is not practiced nearly as much as it used to be. Often uh, churches will practice it once a year uh, if they have a watch night service on Christ New Year's Eve or if they have a Monday-Thursday service. 
Um, others will practice it more, more diligently. Uh, often it, it accompanies the Lord's Supper, uh, but um, most congregations, I would say, uh, practice the Lord's Supper much more frequently than the full washing. Uh, are there uh, denominations, uh, Pentecostal denominations, which uh, no longer practice it or have uh, given up on it? Well, the Church of God in Christ, uh, I believe, a uh, predominantly African-American uh, uh, denomination, I believe still practice it. Uh, the Church of God of Prophecy and the Church of God, that stream of the tradition, no pun intended. Uh, the uh, PH Church, Pentecostal Holiness Church, uh, had always, for the most part, left the, the practice at the discretion of, of uh, individual conscience. Um, the Assemblies has had a little bit of, of practice in its history. But there, is, um, there was a PhD thesis written in 1970, I think it was, by a guy named Wadi Farag at the Dropsy University. <laughs> Great names all. And uh, he, in, in an appendix, he had listed about 125 to 200 groups in the U.S. alone who practiced foot washing. And so um, uh, there are prominent Pentecostal churches that have it as part of their, of their teaching and practice. And then a wide ranging groups from uh, Free Will Baptist, uh, who tend to be rather aggressively anti-Pentecostal, um, and uh, uh, to, to certain Mennonite and bre the Brethren or Foot Watchers, uh, the Adventists are foot washers. It's, it's quite interesting to sort of spread. Um, a lot of Anabaptists uh, that, that had taken up the practice, Moravians uh, were foot washers. Yeah. Uh, in 1970, the Society for uh, Pentecostal Studies was uh, founded and um, uh, I, from what I know, it had as uh, among its members uh, Catholic scholars uh, with uh, an interest in Pentecostalism or charismatic experiences. Um, I'm not sure uh, whether I'm correct on this, but uh, it seems to me that within uh, this society there were discussions or a dialogue between Pentecostals or Catholics, or if not in this one, in, a, in another kind of context. So uh, what were the results of uh, these discussions between uh, Pentecostals and Catholics and um, uh, what is your uh, view on it or um, I'm not sure whether you were involved directly into this but maybe you got enough feedback to be able to tell us more. Well the Society for Pentecostal Studies when it was created was created as part, if I'm not mistaken, of um, the Pentecostal Fellowship of North America and consequently had a statement of faith comparable to that. So Roman Catholics uh, were reluctant and in some cases could not uh, uh, become members. They were associate members. In 1983, I believe it was, no, 1982, there was a meeting at Fuller Seminary in which the statement of faith was changed uh, to more of the World Pentecostal Fellowship and there was um, the Constitution was rewritten in a way that would allow people who were part of the charismatic renewal to be part. Uh, after that time we had uh, several Roman Catholics, a couple of Roman Catholics that have uh, uh, been the president of the, of the society, other Roman Catholics that have been uh, involved in society uh, from one extent to another. Um, and there continues to be a Roman Catholic uh, Pentecostal dialogue both at the SBS meetings and in other, other contexts. Uh, I've not been involved in those very much, uh, though I've had a, obviously a lot of contact with uh, uh, Roman Catholic scholars who are in the society. And uh, my impressions are that um, that, that, well, at the meetings at any rate, there's just a lot of uh, fellowship uh, with, with these brothers and, and some sisters. 
this year, the uh, program chair is Roman Catholic. Uh, the society meets at, at, in Memphis, at Memphis Theological Seminary. And so, um, you know, I, I don't think anybody is very, um, thinks much about it uh, anymore. Uh, there have been, you know, whole issues of NUMA devoted to the official Roman Catholic Pentecostal dialogue. And, um, Any uh, points of agreement or issues on, uh, on which uh, the two parties converged? On? Well, I think there are. But I think part of what they've tried to do is uh, begin with, with understanding how one another uh, puts their beliefs in their own words. Uh, the people that have been the most uh, involved in that over the years have been Mel Roback uh, and Killian McDonald from the Roman Catholic side. Um, and, and, um, You know, it's, it's, it, it, just in all honesty, it's hard for me to assess um, what all has happened and how successful it has been. It looked to me at one point that we were going to have a lot of Roman Catholic participation in, in SBS, but it's never really materialized. Uh, there have been more Roman Catholics involved, but not anything like it felt was going to, going to take off. Uh, many more kind of uh, mainline charismatic, independent charismatic these days. But has, has it helped to ease some of the suspicion uh, towards the Catholic Church and uh, stereotypes that were part of the Reformation or uh, uh, the Antichrist uh, being uh, necessarily the Pope and... Uh, Right. Well, um, interestingly enough, the first people to make that identification were Roman Catholic in the history of interpretation and the effect of history. Um, the, uh, I would say yes. I mean, I think what it does is when, when Pentecostals hear that their brothers or sisters have... Um, run into people who are not very sympathetic to them or their concerns or even have persecuted them, that uh, there are certain channels that, that um, uh, are open to registering those grievances and making a, a difference uh, in, in the relationships. At the seminary, I know that when I say Roman Catholic, I'm going to get probably five different responses. Uh, there are people that have been persecuted by the Roman Catholic Church. In what sense? Um, religious persecution in, in uh, South America, in Central America, um, both politically and um, economically. Uh, there are those who, on the other end, who have never met a Roman Catholic and just believe all the, you know, the, the chick track propaganda. Um, And then there are those who, uh, the only Roman Catholics they know are spirit-filled, and so they don't see a lot of differences uh, between them. And so you've got, you've got a wide variety with a couple of other categories uh, in between. And so for uh, a lot of our uh, Latin American students to, to hear that there are Catholic charismatic folk, that's quite a stretch for some of them. And um, um, the prejudices against the Roman Catholic Church, um, I, I do think some, some of those dissipate. Uh, but, you know, I mean, it, it, as in all of those sorts of um, situations, it's a two-way street. And, and people have to want to talk with one another. Since I know that you've, uh, you have served as an editor for a scholarly journal, Uh, I'd like to ask you to give us in a, uh, briefly some do's and don'ts uh, for, uh, for editors. Uh, <laughs> well, the first don't would be don't do it. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's an enormous amount of work, as you well know. Um, I think you have to have a real sense of, of your purpose. I think you have to not uh, deviate from that very much. 
I think you have to do whatever you can do to make the pro product the best it can be, uh, from the quality of contributions to its uh, physical appearance, etc. Uh, I do think if you've got a real intentional uh, goal, that if it's a good uh, if it's a good idea, it will it will carry itself. Um, there's just a lot of hard work editing, but it's just quite rewarding because you learn lots of things you would not probably force yourself to read uh, otherwise uh, across the theological disciplines as we get more and more specialized. We don't have as much of a luxury to do that. Uh, and it, 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 um, it allows you to um, make certain kinds of contributions to the discussions. Uh, in the JPT, one of the things that we've done and had some success with is always trying to have an out, outside dialogue partner. And we have been amazed at the people that have agreed to, uh, to serve in that way, from uh, Walter Holland Baker to Jimmy Dunn to uh, Jurgen Moltmann to Harvey Cox to uh, Stanley Hauerwas, uh, Walter Brueggemann. I mean, the, we, we've just had a, a great deal of success. The uh, Clark Pinnock, um, the um, kind of the irony is the the people that have been the most reluctant have been evangelicals. Uh, we've had much more response from people theologically to our left. Which are your uh, heroes and uh, which are your models in scholarship and uh, research? If they are not uh, the same. Uh, <laughs> No, that's a great question. Oh, um, let's begin with the heroes. Uh, well, I think I've been obviously been greatly influenced by Metzger in certain ways. Um, a person I did not study with who probably had uh, a great deal of influence on me was Martin Engel. Um, I've met him a few times, and um, at an SNTS meeting in Bonn. Uh, we'd gone to Cologne and had a big dinner and one of his former students arranged for me to sit with him. And so he said to me, well, what do you want to talk about? Hemel does. And I said, oh, I don't want to talk about anything. I just want to engage in some emperor worship. <laughs> Which from his pietistic background was very hard for him to even think about. Uh, but I've devoured all the things he's written. Uh, conceptually, in a lot of ways, uh, people might be surprised by this, but uh, Jimmy Dunn has had a great deal of influence uh, on my scholarship. Uh, of late, um, a variety of um, uh, narrative kind of approaches. Um, Alan Culpepper, obviously. Uh, Andrew Lincoln, my doctor father, enormous influence. In fact, uh, in, in the end, he may prove to have been more influential uh, than anyone. Um, heroes, um, all of the above probably have been heroes at one point or another. Uh, one hero of mine uh, is a, a contemporary, a um, guy named Stephen Fowle, uh, who has done a lot of... Um, theological interpretation of the text. Uh, I'm, I'm quite, um, a lot of confidence in Stephen and, and uh, um, yeah, um, uh, he, he, he probably uh, would, uh, would fit the bill there as, as good as anyone. Any hero from the past or from, the, from somewhere in the history of the church? Well, I suppose there have been more uh, earlier than, than now. I mean, I, you know, I think one of the things that's happened to me is, is you move through that desire to be accepted by the guild to uh, the place God has kind of um, ordained for you to be. And I often think of my work 
as being the stewardship for a tradition that has very few theologians. Uh, for a tradition uh, over half of whom are illiterate. And uh, when I'm invited to speak outside of Pentecostal context, I'll sometimes say, I, I'm very happy to be here, but you have to understand I don't really do my work for you. And I'm, I'm happy to enter into dialogue, but, but there is that, that kind of stewardship. And there haven't been, for various reasons, there haven't been a whole lot of, uh, of models of that. Our forebears uh, were fortunate to just get a, a doctoral training because of all the uh, prejudices. And there's been some really bright spots in that, and that's, that's, been, that's been quite lovely. But, but I think part of it is just a, a postmodern context where, where all, theoretically, all voices are, are welcome at the theological table. And so one begins to see that the more you know what you're doing and why you're doing what you're doing, oddly enough, the more interesting that is to people uh, outside. One uh, name... Uh, I should mention Richard Balkum. I mean, Richard Balkum, uh, he's, uh, he's been a great inspiration. I've learned a lot from him, um, just masterful. Yeah, I would be remiss not to, to mention him. Uh, a major name uh, in the uh, field of uh, Pentecostal studies or from a Pentecostal background is uh, obviously Garton Fee. Uh, how is he uh, perceived by, uh, in the Pentecostal uh, world? Because at some point he uh, did not uh, puts his this uh, bad of identity in the uh, in the first part of his career, so he would be more of an uh, evangelical, at least how uh, people perceived him, and then started uh, writing books uh, with uh, distinct uh, uh, interest in pneumatology, or uh, if I'm not uh, mistaken. So uh, how is he perceived uh, in? Uh well, I think for. Some in the Assemblies of God, there's been problems, uh, perceived problems with Gordon uh, over the way he would uh, envision spirit baptism and initial evidence, subsequence and sequence, etc. I think for Gordon, I think he's always conceived of himself as a Pentecostal. And uh, experientially, in particular, being Pentecostal, one of his former colleagues said that he's a loud worshiper of Gordon. And... Uh, uh, I, I think he's very well respected. I, I think it, it depends on where, you know, he, he's, he, um, he's quite independent and, um, and I don't know Gordon as well as, as others uh, know him, but I mean, he's clearly been the, the Pentecostal scholar that has been the most prolific and highest profile, uh, I, I think Gordon has been uh, influenced a great deal by his contexts, uh, and I once asked him what difference he thought it would have made if, if he had not taught in such reformed contexts, and uh, uh, because I, I think for all of us that that has a has an impact. I don't think Gordon was quite as keen to address, aside from the pneumatology things, to address some of the issues that would eventually get addressed by Pentecostals, uh, uh, Pentecostal biblical scholars. And so I think in some ways uh, his ascent, if you will, in certain evangelical circles uh, and in his writing uh, was, was kind of running parallel to developments that were going on in Pentecostal hermeneutics and Pentecostal approaches.